I'm Ali Patterson. On this episode of Fintech Finance, we're going to take a look in the world of data, particularly around fee and expense management. For this, we headed over to New York to speak with Brown Brothers Harriman, Smartstream, Bray and Bright from Euro XM Bank, and David Breer from 11FS. So I guess the, the sort of digitization of that type of stuff, you know, we're very similar to how we're seeing receipting being implemented in various different industries. So as, you know, OCR technology start to become much more efficient and actually the digitization of all of that paper can be sort of brought about, then, you know, why would you not do those things? I guess still you're sort of digitizing an analog process rather than actually fundamentally shifting what that process is. And anything where you've got a bunch of men just, you know, throwing bits of paper at each other and acting like children probably needs a bit of bit process reform if, uh, if nothing else. So, but we're we're starting to see that in, in you know all guises. Like even the House of Commons is putting a you know a, a digital voting system in rather than just a bunch of bits of paper. So, you know, I kind of think if it's going to happen in in the House of Commons in the government, then it will start to happen on trading fl floors as well. You know, the problem that you've got there is, and similar to you know many of the systems that happen here, is the the traders hold so much weight in that argument that the elements of reasoning and uh, you know even consistency of outcome and stopping uh, allowing sort of uh, untoward processes happening then if you've got some guy who sort of makes it rain and uh, and allows the uh, the whole sort of scenario to, to work then um, they're going to do whatever they need to just to keep that guy happy so it should um, it should be in a situation where actually all of the you know the transactions all of the the um, sort of interactions everything that's being said and done and why the intention behind that should be completely evidenceable currently it's pretty opaque right it's it kind of it's almost like a um, similar scenario to where sort of betting was about 15 years ago you know it kind of came down to what was scrawled on a betting slip of what actually said was going to be done and what was done rather than you know a, a kind of a fully digitized process so uh, I'm sure there's lots of laterals we can draw there between financial services and gambling but um, I'll let you draw those later on. So. I sent Douglas McKenzie to speak with EuroX in Bank to get their views on fee and expense management. Fee expense manager, management for us is very very simple our whole business is based on fees that we earn from moving the financial instruments on behalf of those SMEs and corporates. So before we do any business for them, we make an initial charge to cover our due diligence and that gets offset against their final invoice fee, which they pay in advance. So we charge a fee for our due diligence and that can be offset against the final invoice they would pay, which is based on the face value of the whole instrument, so a percentage of the face value. So unless they're absolutely sure that they want to go ahead with this deal, that the monies are available to pay for the whole deal at the end of the transaction, our fee management system will immediately issue an invoice to them. And before we do anything, we need payment for that. So of course, we're tracking everything that we've paid for by the applicants right the way through the process. And that fee is the lifeblood of the company. That's what drives the cash flow of the company. So we're looking at increasing volume, we're increasing a value of all of those as well to make sure we have a sustainable business here. I then caught up with Barrett from Smartstream to find out why he thought this might be an area that a financial organisation should be concerned about. So if you look at profitability of businesses, how do you improve profitability of businesses in an environment where the margins are uh, very uh, narrow? So taking that into account, if you look at the largest amount, one of the big spend base of the expense is uh, BCNE, which is brokerage clearing exchange fees, which is cost related to the trading activity that the bank or the financial institution is performing. So it's a direct correlation between their uh, revenue stream to what their cost base is. And improving that cost base in, in that space is a direct saving, uh, a direct impact to the bottom line. And that's why it's extremely important to understand that. Uh, part of the challenge today is there's a lack of transparency into where that cost is uh, in terms of by flow, by markets, uh, by providers, how they're spending, how the usage patterns are very, very difficult to kind of recognize in these banks. Uh, so having that transparency drives efficiency in terms of how they can optimize their flows to the market, getting visibility into the market place and understanding uh, the value they can create by optimizing that flow. So every every transaction from a cost of execution standpoint, either it's going to the market for execution, the, there's exchange fees, you have uh, flows that go through brokers or interdealer brokers, so you have brokerage associated with that, 
further downstream, the trades are cleared, settled. So there is a clearing and settlement component to it. Post settlement, there's custody requirements and there's custody uh, kind of component associated with that. When you come to, uh, there are various fixed, there are a lot of other non-transactional fees that are part of this variable expense base, uh, which could be around membership fees, communication fees, uh, ports, port fees. So any, communi any connectivity that you have to the market out there is the cost associated with that. And this whole com encompasses a complete kind of a spend base, what we call it as a variable cost, directly uh, targeted to the trading activity. And now, part of the thing what we do in this space is provide a end-to-end -end life cycle kind of you know, uh, solution and services around that, uh, right from uh, capturing the right level of information to drive that cost. We maintain uh, which basically replicates what the agreements are on, on piece of paper, on what rates they have agreed to uh, bilaterally with uh, other third parties, or even we have a utility where all market exchanges that provide, uh, with basically publish their rate cards. Uh, we manage those rate cards for markets globally. And this is a utility because why we, why we talk this about as a utility is very reason that every bank, if it was to maintain those, uh, the same rate cards, uh, have, are spending time and effort to interpret those rates and to model and, and make them, put them in electronic format. As a service provider, what we are doing is we are taking that information and publishing it to our clients. And that's what our rate card maintenance utility does. Uh, similarly, from an operational utility standpoint, we process invoices for several clients. These relationship of these clients or banks are to the same brokers out there on the street. But then what happens is those relationships are common across each bank, and every bank is maintaining that relationship, processing those invoices independently. But we now are able to provide that as a utility because we understand those relationships and our operational layer basically takes care of a common interface, standardize those processes and provide value to the customer. I then headed over to New York to meet up with Mike McGovern, CIO from Brown Brothers Harriman, to see what their approach is to data management. Well, there's a number of things we're doing in the data space. You know, our data agenda incorporates a desire to uh, create uh, the right governance around the data assets that we've built. So we've you know, built our federated data warehouse infrastructure, purpose-built data marts are in place. We have various dimensions, uh, dimensional data store, uh, uh, dimensional data sets that we've uh, loaded into those environments. Um, the focus really now is shifting to uh, being able to provide a um, analytics around that data, so smart data more than big data in our environment. Um, but certainly, we deal in large volumes of information. So, looking at the, you know, the volume, velocity um, of that data, and ensuring that we have the infrastructure in place to handle it effectively, um, but focusing on analytic tools, focusing on the ability to handle semi-structured as well as structured data in a way that, again, helps us uh, to uh, inform the next set of required solutions to the next set of as yet unposed questions is really where our focus is, and then putting those uh, tools to support that kind of business decision making in the hands of our clients. In, in our business, as we serve primarily institutional investors outside of our wealth management business, the kinds of tools that we've created, um, uh, DealBoard is a great example. We have a tool that highlights um, opportunities to uh, take advantage of uh, strike points in the FX markets. So that sort of makes sense of what is a, you know, a huge, amount of uh, time uh, series data and uh, sort of focuses it and drives a lens that's appropriate to the currencies and the time scales that a particular client is investing in from an iPad. So that I think that's where sort of it's great to be able to process all that data, but unless you can make sense of it in a way that creates some uh, opportunity, uh, closes a gap with respect to information availability for a client in the context of their business process you're not delivering value, and we seek to deliver value of that type in all of our uh, client products, DealBoard being a good example. I also wanted to find out how digital technologies have enabled a bank to make this much simpler. So from a digital technology, uh, uh, there's continuous evolution of technology. 
and part of this uh, digitization of that technology meant means that for I'll give you an example where we take the rate cards they are all on a paper format in a PDF modeling that into an electronic format now gives us ability to actually apply that rate card to a transaction systematically and identify what that cost is rather than having summarized pieces of information and trying to manually do those so there's lack of control in those places uh, so digital technology has basically enabled a lot of control in the whole process uh, automation in in the whole process of, of fees and expense life cycle and digital technology has enabled us to now process a much larger volumes uh, through the platforms and enable uh, the PNL kind of view on a daily basis rather than having everything done manually over, over the month end. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't think the tools are uh, relevant to just those areas, but I would say we'd use this similar tools. So, you know, introducing the right kind of workflow management on top of invoicing processes so that uh, reviews can be undertaken by specialists and if you're producing a, you know, a set of, of invoices that are then going to go out to one of our clients, that's an approach. So we, we, we utilize the IBM process uh, solver BPM suite and we've uh, deployed that in a number of different areas. Uh, we're deploying it in our transfer agency space now. We've had it in place for some time in a number of our custody uh, related, global custody related departments. So those types of tools are one answer. You know, I think more generically, uh, if I look at the process of delivering solutions to our clients, or for our clients, and to our internal clients, what we are looking to implement are improvements around automating the development process itself, so DevOps. And this notion of having a, a completely automated, integrated process that goes through not just development and testing, but also the deployment uh, yeah. and production use of systems. So very focused on DevOps, you know, that's development, IT operations, and the integration between them. Uh, very focused on, on the next generation of our data strategy as well. And all of those tools would support, you know, a more effective delivery of, in your example, expense information uh, in, a, in, in our context as a mutual fund administrator or invoices to our clients for any of the services we provide. I was interested to hear from Mike on his opinion on the idea that banks are becoming more like data IT companies rather than a traditional financial service firm. It's interesting because we're actually, we view ourselves in many ways as a fintech. Um, we actually have a product area that's called fintech and we offer our core platforms, several of them, as platform as a service offerings. The best example of that is our custody platform and indeed we have two other banks. Uh, both of whom are, are uh, you know, publicly known as clients of that platform. Uh, MIBL is one, and the other is SEB, which is the largest right. bank in Sweden. So we view it as a core strategy to offer our platforms to clients who have adjacencies in terms of service requirements, and we see it as accretive to our value proposition because if we can support large global institutions with our platforms, our single global platforms, um, they become uh, you know, more effective from a competitive perspective, uh, uh, more aligned in terms of the investments that we need to make it, uh, to, to continue to sustain our proprietary uh, capabilities, which we believe investing in, in, in a select chosen proprietary platforms that truly deliver what we call trusted value added and differentiated services to our clients, is what, that is where we should be focusing our discretionary IT investment. And so uh, we believe that fintech is not only the uh, raging force in our industry, it's also part of our future at BBH. So I think the future uh, for financial industry is in utilities. Uh, the back office uh, processing that is not the focus area of banks. Uh, banks would want to move out of that area and actually rely on external fintech uh, or services utilities that can provide them that service and, and be very cost optimized at the same time. So I think you would see a continuous kind of you know growth in the fintech industry. You would see a new fintechs coming through innovative from digitizing uh, several kind of you know processes and automating those uh, to kind of uh, create a standardization. If you look at various other industries, what has happened is there's so much standardization in auto industry. Uh, 
everything is robot driven uh, from manufacturing to the time the car comes out. So these processes, they are not very different for every bank to bank. And there is a need to get that investment into those uh, space, in that space, to standardize that process and make it consistent and make it more efficient. And that would simply, it will create an environment for a architecture simplification. It will create a standardized protocol between for the service itself and add value to the banks. A smart stream as, as, as a company, we've been very innovative in terms of uh, where we want to be in the future. So as part of that digitization movement, we are right in the middle of that. So we are investing heavily into our products to and create a lot of innovative kind of ways of integrating these components and, and create that service for our customers. So as SmartStream, we are just not a technology uh, of a shop. Uh, we are a, a end-to-end processing agent uh, which is driven by technology and automation. On the next episode of FinTech Finance, we take a closer look again at customer experience. For this, we catch up with our friends from Metro Bank and also speak with Pitney Burns.